Hey guys, this is Alan. Make another video for Blue Fire Poker. Today I'm going to start a new uh, uh, Blue Fire Poker member review. Uh, this is Blue Fire Poker member Eric. Uh, he plays a suicide ship on the iPoker Network, primarily playing 30 euro and 50 euro games. Uh, his win rate is break evenish, but his EV big blind 100 win rate is about two big blinds per 100, uh, which I consider decent for these games. Uh, I think a lot of, uh, of players that grind out these stakes have a unrealistic expectation of, of how well they should be doing uh, in these games. Uh, the, 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 the main factor, I mean, a lot of times guys just assume, well, the players aren't that good, I should be crushing them, but the rake is the killer. I, I'm not sure what the rake level is in, in say, 30 euro or 50 euro games on iPoker, but I, I would feel safe to say that it's probably somewhere around eight big blinds, might be as high as 10 big blinds per 100. And so when the side is taking 50 to 60 big blinds per 100 off the table, uh, if you include all the players, uh, in order for players to profit, they've got to overcome the rake they put in there, uh, uh, plus take, take uh, additional rake there. And so, you know, if two or maybe three of the players are winners on the table, then somebody's got to be giving up, you know, 60 or 70 big blinds per 100. And most recreational players Uh, will not be giving up that much. I mean, if they're really, really bad, they will. But uh, that's really pressing the expectations out of one recreational player. And so then you're left with um, either being good enough to beat up on other regs, which is certainly something you want to you wanna strive for, or finding tables with two recreational players on them. Um, and it's going to be a, a combination of both. You're going to be, be beating up on regs a little bit, making sure they're not beating up on you, and then as much as possible having position on the recreational player, um, and then ideally having two recreational players on some tables. But that's my way of making the point that uh, it's tough to win big in these games, uh, and I, I really consider these sort of stakes, really not really 50 no limit, but below 50 no limit, I really consider them practice stakes, and, and that's how you guys should be looking at them also. Uh, they're a stake where the play is reasonably good to test yourself, um, uh, uh, and you should be able to win those stakes, but, I, but if your expectation is that you should be making 10 or 12 big blinds per 100, I, I think that's completely unrealistic, and um, if you can make, say, like a two or three big blind per 100 win rate, maybe four big blind 100 win at, at, at the high end, over a decent sample size, it's time to move up to a higher stake if your bankroll uh, I, I can't afford it. And um, ideally, you want to get up to the 100 no limit stake uh, where, where rake uh, does take a fairly big drop as, as far as the percentage of or, or how many big blinds per 100 it takes, takes out of you. And, and the, games, the games are more difficult, but um, uh, in the end, I, I think you, you are now playing a stake where, you know, say like a two or three big blind per hundred win rate, as long as you can play decent volume, can offer a, a fairly good monthly monthly income. You know, uh, at 30 no limit or 50 no limit, man, that's, uh, it, depending on your expenses, you can be okay, but uh, man, that, that is tough, that is really tough. But anyway, so let's get into reviewing this player's game. Um, let's see. It's been a long time since I've done a review like this. In fact, I, I don't think I've done any type of recorded uh, video review, a, a, a review of, of recorded play in a year or two, so I might be a little bit shaky starting out with this. So first off, I want to talk about this player's game. Now, I only had 85,000 hands of four to six handed play, so I'm a little bit limited on to, on to how detailed I could get uh, into it. Um, I, I went through uh, all the major parts of this player's game. Uh, I thought their blind play was strong. Uh, there was a little bit of issue big blind versus small blind opens, but the sample size there wasn't big enough for me to be overly concerned. But if I, but if I looked at big blind uh, versus button, button opens, his play was quite strong. Uh, there was a fairly big win rate issue uh, when it came to what I call first to open opportunities. And when I looked at that, Uh, this player is really tight uh, when it comes to first to open. Now, when you're playing lower stakes, I do think that you have to be a little bit uh, tighter than what I would recommend at, say, like 100 no limit plus, simply because of the impact of the rake. But, um, you know, that's, that's mainly EPMP and to a little degree cut off, uh, and then also cold calling. Uh, uh, and cold calling, especially against EPMP and the cutoff, 
uh, where there's really not much of an advantage to mucking around in those very marginal ranges because the rake is going to eat up most, if not all, of the potential profit there. But he was really, really tight uh, when it came to uh, 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 button and cut off, cut off opens, uh, uh, other positions too, but I was more concerned about with the button or cutoff. Uh, I thought his play was really strong, or, or his play was decent versus openers. Um, uh, given the sample size, it was a little bit lower win rate than I would expect, but was within the margin of error. Um, post flop, oh, oh and uh, uh, play as the play as the three better looked good. Uh, play versus four bets look look good. There was um, um, a little bit of an issue. Um, let me see, I'm just looking over my notes here. Um, yeah, a little bit, I'll just pull my notes over here so you can see what I'm talking about. Uh, there was a little bit of an issue uh, when facing a three bet. Given the sample size within the margin of error, uh, but we'll be looking at that. Um, but a lot of the stuff was just, you know, win rate just a little bit low. This This is a filter for not all in, saw the flop, win rate was 72 versus 77. That's well within the margin of error. Nothing we can really point to there, but it was a fairly consistent pattern. You know, for example, saw the flop multi was a little bit low. Saw the flop as the opener, a little bit low. Um, uh, but other areas were, were good. So we'll just have to go through here and see. Now, it did appear to me that um, this player plays fairly well in bloated pots. We can see here, saw the flop as the pre-flop three better, as the pre-flop squeezer. Very good win rates, much better than the comparison group. Um, uh, also saw the flop as the pre-flop caller was very strong, whereas saw the flop as the, as the three-back caller was very, very weak. But, you know, 85,000 hand sample size, the sample size for this spot starting to get pretty small. So, I'm, but I'm definitely going to be looking at uh, a post-flop play after calling a three-bet and seeing if I can pick up uh, anything there. Probably the thing that concerned me the very, very most uh, about this player's game was uh, the filter for uh, not all in pre-flop, and flop top pair top kicker plus. Uh, his win rate was 839 versus an expected win rate of 1044. Now if you've not watched my previous videos, all these expected win rates come from a comparison database of about 2 million hands uh, taken from strong winning regs. I run the same filters on their game, uh, get their numbers, and then for my clients I compare their game uh, uh, to this game. and, and uh, a difference of two big blinds, uh, 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 200 big blinds per 100, or two big blinds per hand, that is really, really big. Um, um, uh, over this sample size, I mean, there could be some variance there, but uh, yeah, I'm really going to be looking at uh, value extraction issues. Now, for all the filters that I ran, his play overall looked pretty good. I mean, I just pointed out that um, on the flop is a three better squeeze, squeezer. He's absolutely crushing it, so it's doubtful that it's there. Um, um, let's see. Uh, saw the flop. Um, yeah, saw the flop. So I'll be probably looking at more saw the flop as the opener. But um, if we look at uh, turn C bet possible, his numbers look quite good. So, you know, it's probably not a barreling issue. Um, uh, a, one interesting thing I did see was um, big win rate difference here. Uh, saw turn after flop was checked around. So these would be stab spots, uh, delayed C bet spots. I'm be paying very close attention to that. Now, when I filtered for this, it looked like his frequencies were pretty decent, a little bit lower than I, I like in some spots. But it, it didn't appear that he was being uh, way too nitty here. But I'll just be taking a look at this and see if we can figure out uh, what sort of difference here might be going on. Um, however, um, oh yeah, and then also, uh, uh, same, same pattern went on, saw river after the turn was checked around, minus 61 versus 118 big blinds per 100. So in both spots where the previous street was checked around, very, very poor results. And really, other than that, I didn't find anything alarming at all. Uh, I should point out one other thing. Facing a turn bet, results were very, very strong. 160, negative 169 versus negative 201. This is every time he was on the turn and somebody bet. Um, uh, either he checked and they bet or, or, or they were out of position and bet. Uh, and then same thing facing a river bet. Very strong results. So, they're, they're, and that's a lot of, that, that's, those are some of the toughest spots. Uh, bloated pots, the three bet pots, uh, the squeeze pots as the aggressor. 
Those are tough to play. He plays those well. And then facing bets on the Turner and River, a lot, a lot of players uh, struggle with that. In fact, uh, if I were to point to one area where very, very good uh, mid-high stakes players oftentimes struggle, it's, it's, it's uh, facing a, a turn and river bet. Uh, and so to have that right is a, is a, huge, uh, is a huge advantage. So that, that's what I'm going to be focusing on um, uh, as I go through. I'll, I'll look at everything, um, uh, but I want to give you an idea of, of what I'm going to be focused on as far as what's potentially being missed by this particular player. Now, as far as his HUD goes, I am a little bit fortunate in the fact that he uses uh, uh, my old HUD, uh, and so I, sh I should still be fairly familiar with it. Uh, I'll just go over it very quickly. Now, I've, I've switched HUDs myself. I, I use a, a NoteCaddy-generated uh, HUD. That structure is quite a bit different now, and so I've not used this HUD layout in almost in almost a year. It's, it's been ten, 10 months or so. Um, uh, since I switched over, and I've, I've provided links before uh, how to get that. If you want more details on that, let me know. Uh, but anyway, so very quickly, the HUD is VPIP, PFR, um, uh, steals, uh, uh, stab, what is SB? Maybe that's small blind steel? This is, this is maybe a change he made here. Um, yeah, because this used to be limp, this used to be limp call. So I think he must have changed it to something, but maybe small blind steel. Just look at some other players, see if that makes sense. Yeah, that makes reasonable sense. That's not a bad number to have on there. And, and the limp call was the one stat on there that I thought was probably the least useful in the whole, on the entire HUD. Um, and then uh, stab frequency on the flop, how often, if you miss the flop C-bet, will they stab? Uh, this is C-bet, um, um, single raise pot, uh, flop, um, uh, stab frequency, um, and then uh, versus a miss C-bet, um, and then uh, a turn in river, and then fold versus a, uh, a flop C-bet, um, uh, flop turn in river. Uh, bet river frequency, showdown, number of hands, uh, donk bet and uh, donk on the flop and then raise a flop C bet. Uh, these are still frequencies, big blind versus the button, small blind versus the button, and then versus a small blind steal. Um, uh, and then we have three bet, uh, fold to three bet, four bet, fold to four bet, uh, fold to C bet in uh, three bet pots, and then fold versus flop raise. All right, so let's go ahead and start replaying here, and hopefully I won't be too shaky and miss a bunch of action. Uh, we'll just have to see how it goes here. Okay, opening up nines. Sorry about that. I I accidentally, I, I meant to pause the table play, and instead I paused the video. Um, Okay, I was just saying this is going to be table one, two, three, and then four. Yeah, I just I was wanting to check. Um, uh, it, that was a probably that was probably a fine fine fold. But since I am focused on opening up more buttons and small blinds, I want to pay close attention and make sure he's um, uh, uh, attacking the right players. But yeah, this guy's this guy's a short stack, and um, we don't really have any data on him at all. Okay. And that and the hand he was holding, I think it was Jack Seven Offsuit, is not something I'd use very often, but. Uh, it is it is possible okay. yeah so we, at this point we have basically no data on the two players in the blinds uh, just based on their stack size they're probably both recreational players if they are professional short stackers I would ex I would have expected him to have more hands on them uh, typically uh, uh, I'm only gonna be playing probably no more than 45% of my range uh, against players like this. 
yeah, we do want to play in position against weak players, but you know, if we start playing hands, say like, I don't know, Jack two suited or or seven four suited, I'm trying to think of borderline hands I wouldn't quite use. I really question the profitability of of hands that low. Um, it's possible, but I mean, you're going to be seeing a lot of flops. I don't like to see flops too terribly weak, even if my opponents are are fairly weak. Okay, so here on table two, I, he's under the gun. He opened, he got a call from both the blinds. He c-bet, and he got called by both. And then we, had a, we have a card here that we really don't like to see. I'm just taking a look at their game, seeing what I think. Um, yeah, so the small blind has a 22 VPIP and a, was that a, a 21 or 22 preflop raise. So he hardly, hardly ever cold calls. Um, but oh, the sample is small. Oh yeah, and for some reason he's ha he has these numbers double clicked, which means these are session only numbers. Um, and so yeah, we're losing out on a lot of information here. Player two, and yeah, too small of a sample size to draw too many conclusions, but he does appear uh, to uh, to have recreational type player stats. Yeah, that four is bad. Now. Yeah, we got to worry a lot more about two pairs. I, I'm really not that worried about a slow play trips, um, other, uh, other than if they, they have pocket fours. But yes, definitely this, someone could have sevens here. Um, I, I typically don't like checking uh, in this spot, but this is a spot where I feel like if I check the turn, they bet the river, easy fold. Uh, and the easier the river fold is, the better it is to, to turn check um, uh, these type of hands. Um, yeah, pretty much a three, a two, or a seven are the only hands I really would check on. Maybe an ace, because players will be in here with a lot of aces. But other than that, uh, king, queen, jack, ten, eight, um, I, I, I would have been uh, I would have been betting all those. And, I, and I'd also bet any any cards that paired the board. Ace five, ace queen, yeah. Okay. Yeah, with him being a little bit tighter on the openings, uh, I'm a little bit surprised him open up king nine suited in this position. Um, yeah, it's not a hand I would open. It's definitely a, it's a hand I would open in the cutoff uh, under most circumstances. Uh, but, yeah, I'm a little surprised to see that in the middle position. Um, it's one of those hands that's very borderline as far as is it possible. Now, I, I do think like a, in fact, I would, I would say a jack nine suited is probably more likely to be profitable than a king nine suited. Just because a jack nine suited offers more uh, straight and backdoor straight possibilities. Uh, without being dominated quite as much as a king nine, um, both your nine and your king uh, are end up are going to end up being dominated a lot uh, uh, if you end up hitting the same the same one pair hand. Whereas um, a jack maybe a little bit less uh, a frequency because your opponents aren't playing as many jacks, whereas they're playing uh, a fairly decent number of uh, or, or they're playing more kings, I, I should say, than than they are jacks. I don't, I don't like this C bet here. Um, I mean, the only thing we've got going for us is we do have a backdoor flush draw, um, but, you know, 
versus a EPMP open, the guys are going to have a fairly high concentration of of uh, pocket pairs. Um, so, and there's not a lot of. Um, and they're going to have some ace x, king, queen type hands. Um, and I'm not even, but, but one of the problems here is I'm, I'm not even sure how well we do getting him to fold, say, like an ace queen or ace jack type hand. Certainly, certainly we, can, we can get him to fold that king queen, a uh, uh, couple of king jacks that they call, call those. Um, but this is not a spot. So heads up, I, I think it's okay, but three way, um, I don't think so. Although with these players' stack sizes, um, they most are rec most likely are recreational players, but yeah, it's going to put some a lot of t stuff, uh, a lot of tough uh, turn spots. Okay, it's good isolation here, uh, eight seven suited. Um, now I would I personally make my isolation bet bets a little bit bigger. Now if, if he goes maybe like three x with the bottom of his range, and goes more um, three three and three and a half or or maybe up to four big blinds with the top of his range, which I think is perfectly fine to um, be face up uh, with your size and against a recreational player. They, it's very unlikely they'll get, they're going to be able to pick up on that. Uh, given how long they generally stay at a table. Um, uh, so if he's only doing that with the bottom of his range, I think it's okay. But if he's generally doing this, I think this is leaving uh, some money on the table. Because these guys will definitely uh, call a, a, a three and a half X or four X um, uh, isolation size here. It's a good bet, a good C bet there. Um, should be able to take them off some ace X's, um, small pocket pairs maybe, and we do have outs. Not great outs, but we do have them. And then he pots the turn. Hmm. So the question is, is when you pot the turn in a spot like this, is it going to uh, fold out uh, twos and then fives through nines or tens uh, because you potted it instead of three quarter potted? Yeah, it's going to fold out some of those, um, but is it enough to make this um, uh, a good over oversized bet? I don't think so. I, I'd, I'd much rather uh, uh, gone like a two thirds to three quarter bet size. Uh, here. Also, the the ace does connect with a decent amount of their of their floating. Oh, although he's, he just put them all in right here. Okay, yeah, t I take that back. Uh, I should I should be playing closer to these stack sizes. Um, yeah, no, actually I do like this. Uh, now, if they were deeper and there was room for a, a nice size two thirds to three quarter river bet, then definitely go with the smaller size. But now I see why I did that. So over here on the right, we, we really have no information on this particular opponent other than over a couple of hands. He's played a ton of hands. Um, yeah, I would, on this type of board texture, I would just tend to check and give up and hope I hit a four uh, on the turn, but otherwise I'd just try to check it down. I mean, anything you fold out, you're already beating, and, and all we're really beating is like a seven, eight, five, six. Uh, a type of hand, and just way too many hands that connected here or have some sort of draw that aren't folding and we just can't put any pressure 
uh, after we take the stab. So yeah, that was a good check back. And we're basically check giving up and, and hoping to either improve or get the show down. Yeah, good fold there. It looks like he's about to fold here. I definitely would isolate here. Um, uh, three and a half x. To, well, actually, out of position, I'd probably, I'd probably just more go just auto four x. Go to go to two, two euro here. You, your weak aces like like this will be fine against his limping limp calling range. Plus all the folds you pick up. I also don't think it's terrible just to complete here. If if you don't feel quite comfortable with the hand isolating with this. Um, you can actually just complete here a uh, fairly wide range of hands, uh, especially since this other player appears to be a recreational player, which means that his isolation uh, frequency is going to be extremely low. But even with a reg here that's going to isolate uh, uh, fairly frequently, uh, it's still not that terrible of an idea to uh, complete in the small blinds. And by not that terrible of an, of an idea, I mean that I'm almost certain there's some profit there uh, calling with hands. Say, say something hand, a hand like, four or five suited or five seven suited or ace two off if you're not quite comfortable uh, isolating with hands like that which I'm also not 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 comfortable isolating with hands like that but I think they're they're, they're good to go and complete there um, especially in this situation with another recreational player left that 3-4 down here, table 3. So, um, he opens to 3x on the button. Now, I'm not sure if this is his standard um, and he may just be doing this because there's I, actually, I don't know if we've seen button opens before. Uh, I, I think this is actually a pretty good idea when you have, uh, especially when you have two recreational players in the blinds and your ranges are getting capped to say 42 to 45 percent. Uh, I would definitely go go 3x in spots like this, even if just one of the players, especially the, if it's the big blind uh, is a recreational player. I, I, I definitely like going on the, on the larger size. Um, I've talked about this some before, and I've done some more work on this issue, and I'm more sure than ever that min opening is the worst possible opening size uh, on the button. Uh, basically what I did was I uh, used Note Caddy to run... Um, um, uh, filters for diff the profit of different opening sizes and the min opening size by far uh, had the uh, the worst win rate. Um, now I also have to factor in that when you min open uh, you can open up more hands but even with that factored in it was still clearly the least profitable opening size. Now there's there's one problem with my analysis is um, I'm just taking players who, who fit the reg definition, which was fairly tight. They would definitely be a player that you looked at and said, this is a reg player that's reasonably decent. But I wasn't able to factor in if they were like a strong winning player or a weak reg. The, the definition was just, does their statistics match that of a reg player? And I, I, and I think that type of, um, uh, any players that got included in that filter that maybe we didn't want in there would be true of any opening size, I would think. So, um, so yeah, now, and there was another anomaly that, that came in my analysis. It was actually showing something like a two and three quarter size button opening size had the best profits, but I wondered if it was getting skewed by exactly situations like this, where let's say, you know, some decent portion of players 
go with a larger opening size uh, versus recreational players. Um, and I don't know quite how to, how to solve that. I'm still working on this, but it just made me, I, I've, always, I, I've been pretty sure for a long time that mid open wasn't the way to go, and now I'm, I'm almost, uh, almost certain of it. So it um, makes, makes me confident to stick with my standard. Uh, uh, actually, I, I vary them open in size based upon a number of different criteria, but generally it's going to be in the 2.35 to, to 2.6 uh, opening size. Uh, but I still use min opening in some situations, but that has to do with my new HUD, which shows me folding frequencies versus different opening sizes. And there's some players that fold so well to min opens, it's actually fine versus them individually. But that's a, I, I don't really want to get into that. That's uh, not really germane to what we're doing here. We'll keep an eye up on, on other button opens and, and see what's going on. Now we definitely see that here. Um, when it comes to um, uh, playing isolation spots, um, uh, seabed in isolation spots, uh, my, my large database analysis has shown most recreational players uh, will fold uh, somewhere around 45% of the time. They're, they're fairly fit or fold on the flop. Um, they are also, they're also calling, they're also, uh, I wouldn't say they're calling up, they're also locked into their hands enough when they hit value that, that if you do have a value hand, there's no sense being tricky with it. So I recommend a, a pretty high uh, flop C-bet frequency in limp pots. I, I think it should be somewhere in the mid uh, to middle upper, upper 70s. If you need to bluff, if, if you need to bet to win, you need to be bluffing. If you, if you have a hand that's, that's, that, that's value and it's good for two streets of value, if not three, and especially if the, draw, the, the, the board is, if you're, if you're a little bit vulnerable to, to turn river cards, you definitely need to be betting in spots like that. And so most of your checks are either going to be on really awful board textures where you just feel like it just hits them too hard and you have absolutely no way to improve, or you're actually trapping a little bit with, say, like a really weak top pair hand that's not very vulnerable and you just don't feel like it's quite good enough for, for uh, uh, two streets of value. Uh, and other than that, you probably should be betting in most spots. What you did here, and I think is correct. Now, once it doesn't work, then, then you're done. Okay, so he bets three into us, um, and the flush got there. Now, if the flush hadn't gotten here, uh, if it's a non-club 10 or non-club 9, this is a snap call. Uh, players like this will will make these bets uh, as as kind of like showdown protection bets like this. Say they got pocket sevens or a six or even a four. Um, uh, it's it's not just them trying to trap us in here with a uh, with a king. Uh, our odds are good enough to call here. Now now the flush got there. Um, I mean the flush should be something that he's more scared about. So I I tend to think these bets are going to be more weighted to a really strong hand. Uh, kind of the same theory, but I think players like this would be more willing to just uh, check and give up, say like a four or six. But if they've got a, a, a king or, or, or something kind of similarly strong, uh, they might want to protect it. And, and, and they might have got there with the flush, too. Uh, and that's part of what's changed in the analysis here. I mean, the, the, the 10 chains analysis in, in two ways. First off, I think they're doing less protection betting with hands that we beat. Uh, and two, they, they're also going to have the clubs here at some time, although the bet sizing, I, I would expect a little bit bigger bet sizing if they'd hit the clubs here. But, uh, you know, it's, you don't, one of the things with recreational players, you don't want to read too deeply into what they're doing and into what they're thinking. They can um, uh, uh, definitely be thinking about things way, way differently uh, than, than, than you would be. It looks like he's thinking about folding. Yeah, I, I think thinking about enough, I probably would have folded here, but it was really, really close. And I've talked about this before. Uh, recreational players, um, while they generally don't do a lot of bluffing, they where they do bluff uh, typically is uh, uh, on rivers. Uh, and I use the Bet River. This is one of the reasons I like the Bet River number so much. 
because uh, it just it's something that comes in fairly quickly. I mean, not over just a handful of hands, but but it, it'll come in a few hundred, certainly a few thousand hands, and it gives you a really good idea of, of who can bet on the river and, and, and who can't. And uh, if you start looking at this uh, against recreational players where you have a few hundred or a few thousand hands, everything else in their game will be super passive. Uh, no raising, no barreling, no three betting, no four betting. And by none, I mean, you know, you know, pretty low frequencies. But then the bet river will be off the, off the charts. It'll be, you know, 50 or 60 percent, which, I mean, higher than any reg would ever be. And uh, I don't know, my theory has been, uh, something somebody else told me many years ago, is, is they bet a lot of rivers because on the flop and turn, they can just call or check hoping to improve. When they get to the river, and they get to the river a lot with really weak hands, and once they realize, hey, the only way I can win is to bluff, then they're much more willing to pull the trigger uh, on a bluff. Um, um, I don't know why I got off on that, but um, oh yeah, I, I don't remember what my, my what my beginning thought there was. Uh, maybe just about making assumptions about how. Uh, yeah, I think you've branched off of, of making assumptions how recreational players play, and even if they're otherwise very passive, they're uh, and it doesn't appear that that they can bluff and uh, in any other spot, or, or they bluff very little here. The river can be completely different, and I just think it's a loss of hope issue. Uh, plus, they just get to the river so much with hands that that have no chance of winning without a bet. Um, all right, so let's get this going again. Oh, I see why the um, top table is red. Is because uh, it's an anonymous table. Um, I didn't know I poker even had anonymous. I'm not. I don't even know what language this is. But uh, yeah, I, I probably would have recognized if it said player player one, player two. But now, yeah, now I see. Um, okay, yeah, that that well, that's why that's red. Okay. It looks like he was thinking about opening up King Jack off uh, under the gun. Uh, very, very borderline open uh, under the gun. Oh, up here on the right, Ace-5 off. I probably would have gone ahead and isolated that, even though it's multi-way and that, that Ace-5 is pretty weak. Uh, I think it's a fine isolation. But anyway, back to under the gun with King Jack off. Um, yeah, it's very, very borderline open. If I, I think it's okay under the gun plus one. For under the gun, I'd probably want a weak player uh, here in the blinds, which we do have one here. It looks like a 38-14, a uh, which would uh, be a recreational player, although the sample size is pretty small to make too many assumptions. But I think it would have been okay there because of that. But if there was two regs in the blinds, uh, I would not open that up, up under the gun. And certainly nothing weaker than that. Uh, I just realized between pausing the uh, replay video and uh, pausing uh, and then going back and play, I, I somehow paused both of them. So I'm uh, hopefully I'm not repeating myself here. Uh, I just I, I went back in, in in the play to talk about this Ace Nine suited hand. Um, I, I think the Ace Nine suited is probably a little bit weak here. I would need to see something. Uh, Ace Ten suited to me here would be okay. Uh, especially since this player has, has a decent pre-flop pre raise frequency, you're, uh, they're probably opening up all suited aces here. Uh, so I, th I think it's fine. Uh, ace nine suited, I mean, th there's got to be hand that's borderline here. And for me, it, it starts at ace nine suited. And, and I need to see something about my opponent's game that makes me think they play weekly post-flop. And this is especially true in lower stakes games where the rake has taken up a, a bigger cut uh, a larger number of big blinds per 100. So anytime you're going to be seeing the flop, it's it's going to be hurting you in that regard. And so um, uh, I would need to see something like um, uh, lowish flop C bet, highish check fold, something like a 60% uh, flop C bet or lower, 65% or higher check fold. Um, uh, same thing on the turn. Uh, lowish turn barrel, especially like a high flop C bet, 
low turn barrel, say like a 70% flop C bet, 45% turn barrel, along with a decent check fold. Uh, and the way I do this is I only keep, uh, for my HUD, I just keep check fold on the HUD for the flop. But generally speaking, whatever they do on the flop will be fairly reflective of what they do uh, in other spots. Although if you go into my pop-ups, you'll be able to see their check fold uh, on the turn. It's always better to know exactly what to do in that spot. It just becomes a question of being able to uh, have the, find the time to, to uh, uh, look at all the information. But as far as, you know, just like a, a, a quick way to determine can I dip down into more borderline ranges which, uh, versus EP and MP, uh, for cold calls, we'll be talking about weaker suited aces, mid suited connectors. Uh, we like those hands because they can connect with the flop in a lot of different ways. Um, uh, they have what I call high flop connectivity, um, but I don't think they're typically profitable, especially uh, at, at lower stakes, um, unless your opponent uh, has um, uh, clear clear exploitabilities. Now, and then I also look at fold versus raise, uh, and this is fold, fold flop C bet versus raise. Anything over 50% is is nice, and, and if they get a little bit over, above 50%, then, I, then I'm very fine uh, calling hands like this, and, and well, the hands are listed. Uh, we pursue today says mid suit of connectors. Yeah, with the third player left act, I don't think there's much we can do here. But this is a perfect example that if this player had an exploitable check fold um, uh, game, um, uh, we could definitely float here. So we've got one over, we've got backdoor hearts, uh, but um, pause this. Um, with a third player left to act, uh, I, I really like floating in, in three-way situations. Uh, there's two factors going on. First off, how much do people actually bluff in, in multi-way situations? And that's another thing I've been looking at uh, in some detail. And a lot of regs are very, very value heavy in multi-way spots. Um, other regs will, will bluff at a decent frequency, but even the regs that, that bluff uh, are, are, you know, still pretty reasonable. Um, um, and, and that's one of the new things I added to my HUD is I actually have C-bet, C-bet frequency in multi-way pots and then fold versus C-bet uh, in multi-way pots. Uh, in general, I've been looking at multi-way pots in a lot more detail simply because roughly, a, it depends on the stakes you play and of course how often you, you cold call and call multi-way, uh, but roughly a quarter of the flops that you see where you're not all in uh, are going to be multi-way pots, and that that really surprised me when I realized how many how many multi, how many t how much how often we see multi-way pots. Now a lot of those are going to be like somebody limps somewhere in the big blind, but those those count too. Um, so anyway, I've just I've been trying to work more to try to figure out that part of the game, but um, it's actually quite difficult to analyze because you can't just analyze it player versus player because there's multi-way play going on. Uh, but one of the things I did notice is that that general reg bluffing frequencies are pretty low here which you know heads up I think this would be a fine float even without much information here but once you add on the fact that you're multi-way here I probably wouldn't try to float here um, I don't think this guy's gonna bet anything worse than a hand like ace queen ace king with a backdoor backdoor type draw and of course that takes out your ace x outs um, I should get you in a lot of trouble with hands like that. And for those reasons, I, I just fold here. Yeah, and table three here, if he had a check called the, f the turn, I would have definitely bet the river. I, I seriously doubt he's taken that line with a jack X. We can rep, rep a jack X easily. And I think what he check calls there, he's just, he's got some sort of one pair hand uh, that's not very strong and we should be able to, uh, it, it's a classic spot where his range is very capped. And if he's anything decent, which I imagine he probably is with these stats, uh, he would um, uh, 
uh, no, he's only beating a bluff there, and, and we just shouldn't have very many bluffs there when we're, when we're floating in, but when we're calling in position in a three-way pot. Um, now, if I somehow were labeling this guy as suspicious, I need a lot more hands. I need a few thousand hands before I could do that. Maybe I wouldn't do that. Maybe I'd just be one and done. Because uh, a suspicious player will, will go the opposite way and they'll say, how can he rep a jack here? There's, there's already two jacks out there. Uh, but most players don't, um, uh, they're, not, they're not quite sus that suspicious that they're uh, going to call there with, with, uh, with some sort of one pair hand. before we open up king queen off table one ten jacks suited in my opinion you should be opening up all suited broadways uh, in all positions including uh, EP Just checked it. Table one just checked it down. Uh, I would tend to bet the flop here uh, more often than not because of the draw. Um, and this is a recreational player. His ranges are going to be wide here. And recreational players will not generally stab a lot when you check. Uh, but they can be quite hopeful with calling and you know for example if he's got like pocket sevens or something like that he would call um, uh, he would certainly call with any spade draw now it, this player's intention may have been to to go ahead and uh, check once and then bet the turn but then the queen came which is a not a great card obviously because it's it's an over card to your pair uh, I probably wouldn't have, if I were plan on delaying I probably wouldn't bet uh, the queen that well, no, you had the ten for the open ender. Um, no, I actually think I would have I would have gone ahead and delayed bet that because we had the open ender there. Uh, and I just want to make sure we're getting value out of you know whatever that's weaker than than jack ten that that'll call against a draw, and and then uh, of course all the draws. Um, and then bottom right we got king queen against a recreational player that's basically playing everything. Um, He goes ahead and checks here. I, I think this is a reasonable check. Uh, this is a spot where the only hands you're going to fold out are hands you already beat. Uh, typically, if you're only going to fold out hands you already beat, it's not a good bet, um, you know, unless you're vulnerable. Uh, now, we do have a number of straights and flushes here, which um, we could be betting for value, because uh, uh, without a pair, you're going to be beating, beating all those draws. Uh, but yeah, a spot like this, I think it's a fine check, and I'd probably just go ahead and try to check it down. Um, not a great deal to protect against here on the turn. All right, so two of hearts on the river. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, we definitely can't bet here. The question is, if we check, what are we going to be doing then? Now, I, I said just not that long ago in this video that recreational players will uh, are much more likely to do their bluffing uh, on the river, uh, and the theory being that they just see a lot of rivers uh, without a hand that can win at showdown. And uh, I don't know if this is necessarily a, a, a case like, like that, because um, when I say things like that, I'm, I'm meaning more like hands where they've called the flop or they've called the turn or called both. And now they're on the river, and and you check, and they bet. Or oftentimes, uh, players like this will donk out uh, on the river, check call, check call, and then donk the river as a bluff. Uh, 
I've seen that fairly consistently. Uh, in a pot like this that got checked down all the way, I'm, I'm weighed more towards like this is some thinnish value. Uh, a player like this, um, I mean, we don't have hardly any numbers on him, but we're not seeing. Um, yeah, we we really don't we really don't know if he's aggressive or not. Uh, so we really can't rule out uh, a flush here. Um, a lot of times players will play scared against the ace and just check down here. Um, so yeah, it's possibly has a flush there, although this bet size is kind of small here. Um, I mean, I'm gonna have to kind of I'm gonna have to go against my general theory that these players bluff a lot on the river, and so we should be calling quite a bit. Uh, uh, I mean, definitely if I had someone like pocket eights. Uh, anything that beats other than ace x, I would I would definitely call a a, a seven x. Uh, I would definitely call here um, king high a, a, a bit thin I think. Also, his bet river over a very small sample size is only at forty. Yeah, he was bluffing. I mean, I mean I definitely have that overall read that these players w are capable of bluffing. Um, uh, more than one would expect, but that particular spot just didn't feel like it was one of them. Uh, although, for that price, you don't have to be right often. All right, I think this is a pretty good place to go and end this video. Uh, next video will just start up uh, where we ended it, ended off here.